Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay, so the next talk is by Yasuko Shafanameki, and who she'll talk about uh, higher form symmetries in string theory. Please okay. go ahead. So thank you very much, Sean. Thanks to the organizers for this fantastic conference and also for inviting me to speak here. Uh, as Xu Hang already said, I'll be speaking about higher form symmetries in the context of string theory. Um, that's an enormous field. And so I'll be focusing on one aspect in particular uh, that has appeared and dis been discussed in these two papers with my fantastic collaborators, Laksha Bardwash and Max Hubner. So let me actually start with some motivation. Uh, why would we consider this in, in string theory? Um, you can hardly hear me. Greg, maybe you want to tune up the volume. I can also do this. Is this better? Greg? I don't know. Sean, you can hear me? Yes, it's uh, fine. Yes, I can. Yeah. All right. So, why worry? So, motivations. And um, we've seen high form synergies are by now very well established in quantum field theory. So, what's the added benefit of looking at them in string theory? Well, the usual arguments really apply here. We have access in string theory to quantum field theories that may be strongly coupled, maybe non-Lagrangian, or in a regime that we cannot access otherwise, other than realizing them in string theory. So some examples of that are geometric engineering and 5D or 6D theories, in particular SCFTs, uh, strongly coupled theories like holography, and then also non-Lagrangian theories like class S construction. And indeed, in the past year, uh, we've seen enormous amount of work, in particular on this geometric engineering uh, avenue. So for example, in five-dimensional theories, in particular SCFTs, higher form symmetries were calculated, Toft anomalies, and even two group structures were analyzed. Also in holography, the past years have seen some applications of these higher form symmetries to actually refine our holographic dictionary. And that goes into class S duals, ABGM, and also revisiting uh, confinement in the Club Nostrasler context. What I'll actually focus on today is this third point, looking at non-Lagrangian theories, which we can obtain from, say, six dimensions um, via class S construction. So I, I'm not interested just in computing, say, one form symmetries uh, from six dimensions in class S. I'm interested in the physics question, which is sort of modeled at, with this very classic example of 4D n equals 1 super n nodes, where we know the one form symmetry is a diagnostic for confinement. So Wilson lines with area long indicate confining the Acura, where the one form symmetry is unbroken. The pyramidal law implies that we have deconfining, uh, we're in a deconfining phase, and the one form symmetry is spontaneously broken. So the goal of this talk will be to take this paradigm and generalize it to theories that may not have a UV Lagrangian, like in this with the NMOS case. And the class of theories I'll discuss is N equals one deformations of N equals two class S theories. So to do that, actually we need to first generalize or reformulate this super NMOS story in a more class S sort of point of view. So we actually have to do a lot of things we know very well, but in a slightly different formulation. And then at the end, I'll explain uh, this generalization. Okay, so the plan is as follows. Some basics. So Xu Hang already gave a very beautiful introduction to higher form symmetries. Um, I'll just give some more background on that. Then I'll discuss one form symmetries in 40 n equals two classes. And then the third part will be about n equals one deformations. Uh, in particular, revisiting the superimposed case, and then actually providing some examples for non lagrangian theories. Okay, so let's start with line operators. Um, I'll have to talk about polarizations and then how we get the one form symmetry. And the starting point is, say, a four dimensional uh, gauge theory, pure, think of it as pure n equals one uh, superimposed. We have a gauge algebra G and a simply connected group capital G. So the set of lines is uh, the weight lattice modern root lattice. So these are basically what we would call the Wilson lines and then the magnetic version, which are the Toft lines. And both of these quotients are uh, isomorphic to the center of G. Now, the set of lines L is actually not a set of mutually local lines. 
because we have a Dirac pairing, and as we exchange two of these lines, we pick up a phase. So if you insert them in correlators, that gives us some additional phases. So that's what we actually call our relative theory. So I actually get an absolute theory, which has a def definite set of mutually uh, local line operators. We have to pick a polarization, so it's a subset lambda in L, such that all the line operators in that set commute, and it's a maximum set. So for example, for SUN, L is just ZN plus ZN. The non trivial pairing is between the uh, goes on the top line, and that's a one over N. So we can pick, for example, a polarization, canonically just the Wilson line that will give us what we call the gauge group SUN, or the Toft lines, which gives us the PSUN theory, or the many other choices of polarizations, and then counter at least some examples later. So what's the one form symmetry once we have the setup? So we have a lambda polarization inside the set of lines. And the one form symmetry is simply the Pontryagin dual group, lambda hat. So it's the Homs from lambda into U1. And I'll denote that by gamma one. So in this example for SUN, lambda was Zn, and gamma one is an also Zn. What we'll need is a slightly more refined notion of to preserve one form symmetry later on in N equals one when we have a vacuum. We basically would like to know what is the set of uh, the lines that actually have area long. So if I define as lambda r the set inside lambda that has perimeter law, then really the one form symmetry that's preserved in this vacuum is lambda hat over lambda r. And if that's non-trivial, then we'd say this vacuum is actually confining. Okay, so that's the background and let's talk about class S theories now. Um, the class S construction starts of course in 60 to one zero. Uh, then we have uh, an algebra of ADE type. That theory is a relative theory. Uh, we have a two form symmetry and there are surface operators uh, that are not mutually local. So when we compactify this on a curve, so some genus G and some number of punctures, and to get to a 40 n equals two theory, we should think of this curve as embedded into T star C, so some local K3. To get the line operators of this four dimensional theory, we start with the surface operators of the 60 theory and wrap these on one cycles in this curve. So this is basically uh, labeled by H1 of CG, of CG uh, comma Z. So in the simplest case, if you just have a Riemann surface with genus G and no punctures, the set of lines is just H1 of CG with values in Z hat, where Z hat is this two form symmetry group of the 60 theory. So we can decompose this now into A cycles and B cycles. This is Z hat are the A cycle ones and these are the B cycle ones. And then we see again, there's a non trivial pairing on these lines, which descends from the pairing in Z hat and also an intersection pairing of the one cycles on the Riemann surface. So what we get from this compactification is a relative theory again. So again, we can pick some polarization. The simplest ones are just pick the A cycles or the B cycles. And then the one form symmetry of this class S theory is then just lambda hat. So the Pontryagin dual group to lambda. So here I simplify this problem. I just looked at a non-twisted theory. It's just genus G. And there are many interesting refined notions that arise in class S uh, from these twist lines. And I won't be discussing them because I'm actually trying to head to n equals one and the time is short. So before I go to n equals one, I actually want to discuss a sort of an interlude on genetic engineering because we can think of 40 n equals two theories also as arising from type to be geometric constructions or a compactify to be on a non-compact Calabria three group. So X here is non-compact. So there's a boundary of uh, del X. And now we can ask what's the one form symmetry of this 40 n equals two theory that we get from this engineering uh, compactification. And here the line operators are basically the three brains wrapping non-compact three cycles. So they give rise to, to line operators, modular screening by local operators, which are these three brains and compact three cycles. So mathematically, this means we're looking at the relative homology of X with respect to its boundary and mod out the H3 of X. And those are the lines for, from this dramatic engineering setup. 
And indeed, we can also write this simply in terms of some second homology of the boundary geometry. So what's nice about this point of view is it's computable for any sort of you know, geometrical engineered theory, for example, for our double effect theories, uh, which are you know, not easily accessible uh, otherwise. But also we can sort of check what we talked about earlier in class S. We have uh, some class S theories will be ALE vibrations over everyone's surfaces. So if you have these simple cases, no punctures, then there'll be just these types of geometries. These are local uh, color field three folds. And we can now compute for these geometries exactly this, this, uh, the set of L uh, from the homology. So the LE vibration here is governed by Higgs field, which satisfy the Sitchin equation that's written out here. And so phi is just so the, the, the field whose vector curve is just a side regression curve. So you get some n shaded cover of the base curve, which is the variable of the curve. And now applying this to this problem, uh, computing now these homologies, we find exactly the same as what we found earlier using just a class S description. Okay, so that's just a comment that this dramatic engineering approach also allows you to calculate these higher form symmetries uh, that applies not just to 2 b but also to M theory, to F theory, and the many developments that we can discuss uh, later on. Okay, so what I want to head to is the n equals one deformations. So if you actually would like to get to 40 n equals one from 60, uh, we don't compactify on a Riemann surface that's embedded in the local K3, but actually in the local color BL3 fold. So here I'm taking the simplest sort of possible thing. It's a sum of two line bundles of suitable degree. And in fact, I have two sections, fine, fine. And I'm even simplifying this further. I'm starting with sort of phi being this n equals two Higgs field and psi is just an additional Higgs field, so it's zero form uh, on the curve. And these now have to satisfy to get to for the n equals to one theory, a generalized set of Hitchin equations. So they're very similar to the n equals two case, but uh, the more, slightly more complicated system of equations that we need to solve. And so each of these, the spectral curves for each of these two fields, phi and psi, define an n sheeted cover over C. And the strategy now will be, we start with an n equals two Higgs field, and then we, what's in the literature called rotate to n equals to one. And what it means is just, we then turn on the field psi and then go to a particular point in Coulomb branch where we can actually solve the system of equations. So the case we're interested in is confinement. So actually the starting point should be 40 n equals two pure animals. So I need to explain or re recap briefly where this comes from. It's of course very well known. We start with SU2 for simplicity. Um, this is the brain system, twin has five brains, two D4 brains. Um, the cyber written curve for that is written out here. So we should think of T as essentially the coordinate on the base curve, which is a P1. Um, v is the the, sorry, the, 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 the coordinate on the curve, on the cover, and U is on Coulomb branch parameter. And now we can translate this cyber curtain system now to a class S construction, where we start with a genus zero curve, and now we have two punctures, but these punctures are irregular. So they have poles that are of higher order than one. In fact, here, the pole order for phi um, is three halves. So this quadratic differential is pole order three. At both of these. So these are these so-called P0 punctures. So how do we go from n equals two superior moles to n equals to one superior moles for SU2? We have to now in addition consider this field psi. We determine what kind of boundary conditions it has at these two punctures, and then we sort of solve for these Hitchin equations, these general Hitchin equations. So the first thing I'll do is at t equals infinity, I'll just impose the psi asymptotes to essentially phi. So phi was this one form. So in fact, I need to contract with some vector field. So psi goes to mu times phi zeta. And then at t equals to zero, I just want psi to be regular. So now with these boundary conditions, we can now solve for these DPS equations. And one of the equations says phi and psi need to commute. And so they, if they're both di diagonalizable, we simultaneously diagonalize them. And for generic enough spectra, uh, the branch code structure actually of these two things has to agree because one has to be a function of the other. So we can now solve this analytically. And given the time, I will actually just tell you how we do this topologically. 
So what we actually have to do is take the two fields, the spectral covers, and then actually match the branch cut structure so that it agrees. So we have one consistent uh, cover of the curve. So I just described this to you, but there's also some analytic uh, approach to this problem. Okay, so this is the uh, curve for the field phi, so that has coordinate V. You have these two irregular punctures. There are two additional branch points. The branch points are the crosses, and then there are these branch cuts between them. For the additional field psi, this n equals one field, um, we have one irregular puncture and then one branch puncture, a branch point here connected with a cut. And so now we have to tune common branch moduli to bring these to the same sort of branch cut structure. And so one way of doing this is to collide these two branch points and to move both of these points to t equals to zero and infinity. And there are exactly two loci where this is possible and the resulting curve is written down here. So if you actually want to get to what's more commonly known as the n equals one curve, you also have to take out limit mu versus infinity. And then basically in some rescaled coordinates, we also introduce this n equals one scale, then we have these two curves. So there are two choices of the sign here, but those are the two curves that we can find. And basically those describe the two vacua of the SU2 theory. So one is simply, we have these two regular punctures connected by a branch cut. And then the other one, there is an additional sign change in the W coordinate, and that can be uh, furnished by actually going around this cut, um, uh, going with the cut around this branch point. Okay, so this, these are the two curves for the two vacua. So now we'd like to actually see what are the line operators and are these, or in which of these polarizations are these actually confining. So more generally, let's consider we have some lines. We have lambda is a polarization for the class S theory. Then actually the n equals one vacuum um, characterized by some curve sigma r will have the following one form symmetry. So we need to first define what actually is the set of lines that have perimeter law. And we conjecture that this is this following set. So these are projections of one cycles on this cover that project non trivially to one cycles in the base. So those are the perimeter law lines. So if we intersect those with the polarization, then those are precisely the ones that are sort of not, uh, those are the ones we would like to mod out. So lambda over lambda cup cap IR is basically the set of lines we're interested in that have area law. And then the Pontiac and Dewey group of that is the one form symmetry in this vacuum. And if this is now non trivial, then the vacuum is confining. And one way to see that this is the correct criterion is to remember to the argument of Witten that the confining, how the confining strings arise in this kind of setup from membranes that sort of end on relative cycles in the Calabi Allen signal. So let's look at how this works for SU2 again, very briefly. So if SU2, the line operators are the Wilson and the Toft lines, there are these, the following cycles, W is here, and then H is this relative cycle between the two irregular punctures. We need to determine now these sets of lines that are have perimeter law. Both of, if you go twice around this branch cut, so two W should be zero, we should mark this out. And then the I plus curve, um, the H line is also trivial, and the other case H plus W is trivial. And so now if you actually put it all together, you have the different polarizations for SU2. These correspond to the following global forms of the gauge group, SU2, SO3 plus, and then the change data angle SO3 minus. Then in each of these two vacua, sigma plus and sigma minus, we find the following one form symmetry. And that's of course very well known in much more general terms discussed in the reading between the lines, but now we got this purely looking at this um, uh, curve picture. Of course, this can be generalized to n equals one super angles. The branch cut structure is more complicated in this case. Again, there's a topological argument to collide the, the various uh, branch points to then find that the curve for the n vacua is simply, you have a branch cut as the n branch cut that r times and circles one of the um, irregular punctures. And then we have precisely uh, n such a vacua. Okay. so. I think I should probably, how much, when did I actually start? Uh, you got uh, five minutes to go, five and a half minutes. 
now let's actually do something new. So let's actually talk about the theories that actually are not sort of known theories where we know that it should be confinement, uh, but things that using this sort of method, method we can now argue for confinement, although there's no Lagrangian UV description. So the starting point is the 60 SUN theory. We put on a sphere with alpha irregular punctures. So irregular puncture for SUN basically means we have poles of order one plus one over n. The simplest case is just we have three of these punctures. Right? So two was the supriangles case, we add the third puncture there. And um, this corresponds to essentially to starting with a the TN theory and engaging three of all three SUN flavors. So this is sort of a picture for this uh, TN comma three theory. And the line operators are again simply uh, obtained in terms of the Wilson lines and circle the punctures and the Toft lines span between the punctures. And then in this case, there's a relation where the sum of all the Wilson lines and some of all the Toft lines need to vanish. Again, this is sort of a, a, a relative theory. There's a non-trivial appearing, and we can choose, for example, the simplest electric polarization in this case. We just look at the Wilson lines. Okay, so now the, the logic is the same. We start with this n equals two thing, and now we go to the n equals one. We need to, now this is the curve for the n equals two, two. So this is the V curve, big silk, and um, it has these three irregular punctures and then the branch lines and branch points. And on the n equals one, so this psi field has the following curve, where now these irregular punctures, two of them have been rotated, but the third one is just the branch point. So there's no singularity at that, at that point. And so now again, we can analytically sort of find a solution to the Hitchin system, or we just look at the branch cut structure and these two things will match. So in fact, this is sort of the structure in which we degenerate uh, this picture. So once we repeat this and look at, for example, this electric polarization, we see that this theory in the, this vacuum that's described by this curve has a V3 times V3 uh, one form symmetry. And so it's confining. And there's a whole family of this type. So we can generalize this to the SUN with now N P0 punctures. There are these line operators, which are coming just from Ws and from Hs as before with the relation. So these are Zn to the n minus one and Zn to n minus one. And then again, we have sort of this, the same procedure applied to this particular um, set of uh, cuts in the plane. We, we, we match the two curves, the V and the W curve. We find that there's a vacuum that have, has this particular structure. And now looking at sort of the electric polarization, for example, can show that this actually has a preserved one form symmetry, at least for n equals to n prime. Okay, so this is sort of a way of showing that with this method, method you can um, arrive at confining theories that have no at least obvious UV Lagrangian description and um, to argue for the presence of confinement in such uh, setups. Okay, I should conclude. Um, I hope I gave a glimpse of why studying higher form symmetries in string constructions is interesting. I focused on this n equals to one construction and because it sort of gives a nice prediction for interesting confining theories that we might not have found otherwise. Uh, in that particular context, it'd be interesting to compute anomalies and to determine also what are the TQFTs that govern the IR of these confining vacua from the 60 point of view. And there are topics that I, didn't cover, but I'm happy to discuss in the Slack channel. Uh, I think one interesting direction are these higher dimensional gauge theories and the higher form symmetries in that context. And um, the interesting Toft anomalies that have been proposed and uh, also higher group structures for such theories. So mixed mixtures between zero and one form symmetries um, as Shuang was already explaining. Okay, and then finally in holography, there are interesting developments as well. And one thing that I think sort of in this context of confinement that might be interesting is one can revisit now the klebanov schussler solution in the context of these higher form symmetries. So there's a one form symmetry, which one can see the imprint of in the holography. And then actually using the supergravity, derive what the IRT QFT is uh, that governs the uh, theory uh, at the deformed conifer. Okay, so let me thank you for your attention.
Thanks, Sukura. Another perfectly timed talk. That's great. So we, we have time for questions, either in the chat or you can raise your hand. And there is already a question from uh, Maria Pilar Garcia. Uh, can you comment on the extension of your results to M theory? Uh, right. So in M theory, uh, let me just go to the slide for the. So in M theory, you can again compactify, for example, on a singular color VL3 fold, um, and then ask in this five-dimensional theory, uh, what is the one-form symmetry, for example? And again, it's about understanding where the line operators come from. In that case, for example, uh, you have in two brains wrapping now non-compact two cycles, um, modulo screening by compact two cycles. And so in that way, you can then determine the one-form symmetry of the 5D theorem. Now that sort of tells you it's it's essentially information that is so blind to where you are in this five-dimensional modular space, whether it's a Coulomb branch or the Higgs branch. So in some sense, it tells you uh, potentially about the one-form symmetry of the CFT itself. Um, and of course, you can also extend this to M theory on G two, and then play a similar game, uh, for example, with the um, G two manifolds that uh, give rise to and 40 n equals one to the n most, for example, right? Something that I think my chair has worked on in the very, very far past. Is that answering your question? Okay. Yeah, we have definitely have time for some more questions. Um, there will also be a session, I should have mentioned this earlier, the, the, later today, um, Cyborg and um, Xiaogang will have a discussion on related topics where definitely any questions that occur to you later can, can, be, uh, can be asked. Um, so should I just wait another minute in case somebody thinks of something? Dan Harlow. Um, no, I was just wondering if you thought about uh, these non-invertible topological symmetries that Shu Han was talking about. Yes, we, we have. Um, how one would realize them in string theory? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. In particular, these O2 uh, theories that were discussed by Irene and collaborators, um, potentially we could construct them in some string theory uh, construction, also made from six dimensions. That'd be very interesting, but well, that's yeah, in progress. All right, why don't we uh, thank Sukura again? Oh, sorry, there's a talk from uh, Ed Witten. Uh, please go. In your talk, you were uh, compactifying to four dimensions to get 40 theories. But presumably, if you simply worked in 60, you'd have um, a two form symmetry. Two -form symmetry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Has anything interesting been done uh, in 60? So, in 60, the, right, we have this two form symmetry. Uh, I just mentioned very quickly here. Um, so, the right here you have objects which sort of have a pairing FF is one over N, for example, SUM. And so, it's not. It's a relative theory already from the get-go. Um, so I think in sixty itself, uh, so the, the theory itself, you really should define it as more a theory that is the boundary of a seven-dimensional theory. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, yeah. I think what one of the points I think that is sort of interesting to note is whenever you consider any kind of background, be that. A, a compact space times another compact space, or any types of um, uh, d plus p is equal to six dimensional space time, you actually need to choose, in some sense, a polarization already in six dimensional. You, you have to choose already some kind of um, subset in this H3, yes. in the, the sort of self goal three forms. And that's an important piece of information. So, already also in the 3D, 3D correspondence, is an important piece of, that one needs to take into account to actually get a full 
a picture of the correspondence. I um, guess I guess the reason you say it has to be a rel should be a relative theory. Well, in four in four dimensions, when we we can pick a Lagrangian sublattice without breaking four dimensional symmetry. Yeah. Whereas in six dimensions we can't. Yeah. No. At least that's the difference. Yes, I, I think that's true. Yeah. Oh, uh, thank you. Very good. Thank you. So again, if there are any more questions, tell us this discussion session later. And uh, thanks, Sakura, again. Thank you.